this Hangout on Air is live. At least that's what Google is telling me. Do we trust Google? I don't know. Um, so I meant to open up the uh, chat and forgot because I was busy talking. Uh, let's get the pronunciation of your name first because I think I got it. I've always said it with an emphasis on the second syllable, and then I heard you say it once, and it wasn't that. So it's Amy. I can't even say it correctly, but it's, <laughs> most people say Burval, um, but it's actually Burval, and it's Swedish. It's from the very far top, tippy top north, so it's Burval. But <laughs> I'm not going to expect anyone to say that. Just say Burval, like rhymes with furball. About that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have been saying it correctly, Amy Burval. Uh, well, actually, you know, I've been saying Amy Burval because I'm Canadian. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> ah, yes. yes. Do the Swedish, at least the Swedish ah. <laughs> yeah. So, welcome. Um, I'm just going to take a second here and open up the. Uh, this is me being distracted right as we start this broadcast because what would an e-learning 3.0 thing be without random distraction? Uh, oh, I can uh, do jazz hands. I'll distract you. <laughs> okay, yeah, you do jazz hands. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right, almost there, almost there. <laughs> Can we see who's joining us, or? Uh, so it's we've got four viewers already who are being treated to a. Uh, <laughs> well, a aloha, four viewers. This is Amy quite early in the morning in Hawaii. Okay, starting. Okay, if you're wondering what I'm doing, it's. Um, I have this thing called Grasshopper that I've been using, and the chat isn't really great. Uh, and I have to start it up instead of people just joining it. And uh, I had forgotten to do that. But now I have done that. And uh, so uh, if, you, if you are listening, if you uh, use Twitter and use the hashtag EL30, or if you use Mastodon, you use the hashtag EL30, uh, your comment will show up in our chat. Um, and uh, I guess there's a group chat on YouTube as well. Anyhow, I have both open today. This is the first time in 10 videos in this course I've done that. So, wow. And, and I'm seeing a, the dog tracks thing come up, finding a poem among the words of others, which is really great. I so totally recommend it. Anyhow, um, we got another viewer. Yay. Uh, which means we didn't lose any of the viewers we had. Oh, they're Yay. gone. <laughs> oh, that's what you get for living and dying with the number of viewers. Um, <laughs> so I have Amy Burval with me. Raval. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha. And you're in Hawaii. Where in Hawaii? I live on the island of Oahu, who, yes, experienced our ICBM missile alert this year, <laughs> just a year ago, actually. Uh, and I live on the on the east side, which is a little more rural than what people are used to with Waikiki and all that. So the one time I was in Hawaii, and yes, I've been once, I drove, I rented a car and drove out to the east side, as far down that road as you can, first on the south side of the island and then on the north side of the island. And I tried, there's a little gap that you have to walk, and I tried to go from one end of that to the other, but there's a great big ravine in the middle of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can't do that. <laughs> and so, it's quite dangerous out there. Yeah, but it's beautiful, um, and uh, so it was totally worth the walk, but yeah, I was sort of disappointed. I thought about trying to cross the ravine, and then I thought, no, that would be a bad plan. There's a metaphor in that, so in there somewhere, right? <laughs> Crossing the ravine. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and I also climbed to the top of uh, that big volcano. Not Diamond, the, Diamond Head. Diamond Head, that's it. Yeah. I was going to say Moana Loa, but I knew that was wrong. 
Yeah, Diamond Head was a lot of fun. Yeah. Good hike. So you are known, I'm trying to figure out where to start because I know we'll be fine once we get into this. <laughs> we were having a great conversation before this started and then we had to start the thing. Uh, so, all right, everybody knows you as a really creative person um, and they know you for pink. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure everybody asks you about why pink, so I won't. Um, <laughs> so um, the the things that you've done over the years. Um, so you, you've got your website, of course. You've got your creativity consulting. Uh, you're a teacher, and as you said, you've been teaching uh, just over the last uh, few weeks, which is. Uh, a nice thing to get back into the classroom, I guess, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, oh, I see see if I show the things and I lose them. I'm muttering to myself. Um, okay. Uh, you've put up videos of you singing about history. Why don't we start there? <laughs> okay. That was uh, my first experience publishing my creative work to the world. And this was back when I was teaching uh, world history at a high school here in Hawaii. And I actually was going through breast cancer treatment treatment at the time. So it was very, it was a very strange and dark time for me. And I was uh, up all night with insomnia and I didn't have hair and I, I owned about 15 wigs. And one night um, in a kind of cathartic frenzy, I penned some lyrics to a poem, really. I mean, it became a song, but it was, it was kind of riffing off of Ava, uh, money, 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 and it was about Henry the Eighth. So that was my first one, Henry, 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 and I just kept going with this poem. And I went to school and I sang it to my colleague, who was a really amazing musician as well as Flash animation expert back. And he taught Flash actually, and he says, "Hey, we can make a video out of that. Let's record you." And make a music video for your students and that that became a whole you know like 55 videos later two years later that kind of thing it was actually the students that encouraged us to put it on youtube because youtube was just starting out at the time and they're like hey there's this new thing called youtube and right then it was it wasn't a lot of production quality it was a lot of cat videos a lot of <laughs> just irl kind of stuff and uh, we so we were one of the first kind of education channels in a way that provided some whimsy but also some you know little nuggets of things people could use as a hook for a lesson or as a study aid but what was so weird was what happened when we put things out there because suddenly it was a barrage of emails and comments and could you be on this TV show could you be on this podcast could you be <laughs> and then and what was even weirder were fans were translating the lyrics into their own language, Turkish, Chinese, all kinds of languages. It was fascinating. And, um, and what I learned from that experience was that not only is creativity healing, because it did get me through this kind of dark time, but also that if you publish for an audience and you have in your mind who that audience is going to be, you know, like, oh, history teachers and history students, you'll always be surprised because people that you don't expect will appreciate your efforts. So um, I had people who were um, hard of hearing write me that they love the subtitles. I had people that were learning English say, oh, we love your songs for learning English and helping us with our English. So you never know who you're going to touch really when you put your work out there. And we were just having fun. We were riffing on 80s music videos. That was why that's why a lot of them are 80 songs, actually. <laughs> and also, um, people, oh, this is one weird thing, too. People wanted us to do requests. But it was my baby. I'm not doing requests. I'm just doing yeah. what I want to do. You know, I'm doing the songs I want to do, the topics I want to do. So, mm -hmm. no, I will. And then they always wanted us to be more literal. Like, you should do one about the Berlin Wall to Pink Floyd's The Wall. And I'm like, actually, that's. <laughs> too literal that's not the juxtaposition i was going for <laughs> exactly yeah so my big concept with remix is that you mash two things together that shouldn't be together really <laughs> now i've always wondered um 
there was one, and I think it was you, but it might not have been. I saw it ages ago on the uh, the seven day queen that was put up and then had to be pulled because of a complaint from yes. France. That, that was, was you. That was me. That was Lady Jane. Lady Jane, and it was to a Prince song, Cream. Yeah, and I I think it's because Prince was highly sensitive about stuff. Rest his soul. Um, he was very particular about his work being parodied or whatever. And so that was the only one that, that actually got pulled down, which was sad. It is sad because I liked that one. And it was the first one of those that I saw. It was the first that I ever had ever heard of you at all. And it took me years to put two and two together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's funny to look back on that experience now. But that experience got me into a lot of other things, like really looking into remix as a culture. Mm -hmm. and getting involved with that, doing other remix projects, um, looking into transparency of work as a thing, and also, of course, multimedia learning and all that. So it really was the hook for me to get involved yeah. in other things. So you've basically transitioned from, well, maybe not from, but uh, from being a teacher into being a creativity expert. How does, <laughs> how does that happen? uh doing it <laughs> actually making stuff every day no um that for me it's so important to make something every day van gogh has this thing uh quote make something beautiful every day and i try to make something just for my own sanity whether it be a doodle a video a blog whatever but what happened with teaching was i was being asked to present a lot on you know from the remix experience but then i got involved with ed tech and you know this kind of thing helping teachers integrate technology and i really loved working with adults as learners and then i got uh kind of drafted into a position which really opened up a whole new world for me and that was to work in san francisco at a startup called edge makers um, designing curriculum about innovation and creativity for schools in india and colombia and brazil hmm. so that really was exciting i got to to visit San Francisco every month and work on that and do amazing things with really interesting people. And, and in the meantime, my own creativity kept going and I kept learning from my experiences of, of making things, right? Um, and then I got together with uh, a fellow teacher in Maine, and this is after I left the classroom and you know working for the startup. And we said, why don't we write a book together? So, <laughs> because he had amazing experiences and ideas for his in his teaching, and I had a whole cache of things that I tried in my classroom that worked and things that I do myself. And so that became my next endeavor was writing um, a creativity handbook really for teachers. And then right now. I'm working with the State Department on on translating that into like card decks that can be used in Africa for English language learners and stuff. So my joy now is like just working with adults and helping them be more creative teachers. Um, but I also have worked with corporations and run workshops. I hear Kitty. I hear Kitty. Yeah. He's, oh. <laughs> Alex. I guess he wants to. He has the run of the office, except Good. the door is closed. As, as it should be. Yes. <laughs> so he was led in, and I didn't even notice that he came in, because I'm talking here, and then he was meowing at the door, and now he's out. <laughs> so so the, the, uh, the book, I guess, is the, um, uh, is the one titled Intention. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> in lovely punk <laughs> colors. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> intention, critical creativity in the classroom. And so tell us, the. I guess the book is a bunch of recipes for creativity in the classroom, right? Yeah, the, the first three chapters kind of frame our thinking, but then mm -hmm. the bulk of the book is broken down into just many recipes according to theme, like creating with words, images, the body, other social media stuff. And there are... Two things that are different about it is we wanted to make it a living book mm -hmm. because I'm I, I'm a big believer in that a book should be a conversation and not just you know solidified into two covers and nothing else happens and you can't remix it. So we wanted to make it remixable. 
And sure. one of the things we did was create a hashtag for every activity so that when teachers do it in the classroom or tweak it, implement it, remix it, they can share on social media with that hashtag. And then we get a community growing and it, and it has, it's really been interesting to see how teachers take our little prompts, right. which is sort of more of a muse, and then they riff it to, you know, make it happen in their classroom and share the pictures. So that, that was one big thing. And we don't call them lesson plans. We call them pathways because we do want to encourage people to, to make them their own. But what's cool is um, it's based on two things, creativity as a constraint, that people mm -hmm. work best not with total freedom, but with actual constraints that frame a creative task. And also with the notion that intention uh, is the learning is shown through your articulation of your intention behind your work. So getting students to talk about why they made the creative choices they made. So not really assessing their, you know, how pretty was your thing that you made, but it was, it's more like what's the meaning and reasoning behind what you're doing. So I used to write articles for James Morris in, in, in his various journals over the years. And he's a very careful editor and he would send me back his comments and questions about, you know, this phrasing or that phrasing. And I would send him fairly detailed explanations as to why I chose to express it this way rather than that way. But these explanations were always after the fact. I wasn't mm. thinking about them at the time. <laughs> yeah. So isn't that the case here? Um, when when you're looking at why people are creating things, aren't they coming up with explanations after the fact? Or do you think they are? I think in some cases they are. But with, uh, with our particular activities, it, the whole process involves the metacognition and articulation mm -hmm. of that as they go, so as they're creating. And our philosophy behind that is if, if they build it, they can, they'll get it, you know? So if you, right. if you physically, if you make things um, and talk about it and be really transparent about it in the process of it, then it'll be sticky. I love the word poignant because it actually means to prick. And it's like, <laughs> me, I think like that's the best thing is if something's poignant, you know, what makes it stick so that you'll remember it. Poing. I'm just trying to think of what language that might come from. I think it's, well, it's from French, like point, point. Yeah. But, oh, but, yeah, point, point. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I looked up the etymology one time, and it, when it when I read, because I was using the word all the time, right? And a lot of students don't even know what it is. I mean, I said, what's that mean, Ms. Burval? Yeah. I said, I don't know, you know, like, I'm trying to explain it. And finally, I looked up the etymology, and when I found out that it meant to prick, I really <laughs> thought that was that was pretty poignant. <laughs> no, because, yeah. it, because it does get to you, like what moves you or what is gonna be there and linger, you know, for all time because it did something to you. Maybe even made you uncomfortable, but yeah. I like the way language is structured that way where, you know, uh, there's this, this family of concepts around a single word. It, it op actually operates more in other languages than it does in English, because English is just such a, uh, you know, a mess of, influences from different languages <coughs> mm -hmm. you know yeah you have the root and then you can make it a verb ad adverb whatever just by adding suffixes or so we do that with actually we do that a lot in english as well you know like uh, you know hedge or you know I, i'm yeah. looking at a hedge right so that's why it's a hedge or anyhow i was totally off topic but <laughs> no actually that's a, that's a thing in my book is making portmanteau <laughs> right. yeah because i mean I, word play is so mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. that's one of the best things you can do creatively is is word play and make up new words and experiment with language yeah. and speaker yeah yeah uh now I get the sense, reading what you've written and talking with you, that you really see that there's a process to creativity, that, that there's a rigor to creativity. Is, am, am I getting that right? Yeah, actually, it's funny that you mentioned rigor because in, in our book, we have a concept called rigorous whimsy, which is sort mm -hmm. of taken off mm -hmm. as the, the go-to thing. But yeah, I do think, um, so there's a lot of backlash because people like Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson and everybody are calling for more creativity and learning in the classroom, 
there's this backlash that that's all fluff and you, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can't assess it or creativity is for artists. The right. thing is, it's not, the thing for me about creativity is that you need dots to connect. So if creativity is about connecting dots, you got to have mm -hmm. the dots. And the dots are your experiences and your knowledge and all the things you collect over time. So the reason I remix, I mean, I can't remix unless I know, you know, that 80s song and that particular piece of artwork, you know, there's no way I can create something new unless I have the pieces. So I don't think there's a dichotomy. I think that there, there can be a rigor with creativity and you do also need knowledge to be more creative. They're not <laughs> inseparable, right. you know, they're not something to separate. And um, and I think with the process, for me, yeah, it's a lot about work. I mean, cre studying artists and, and even just inventors, famous scientists, whatever, it's all about hard work and the word passion, which we always associate with somebody being passionate about something, it actually, you know, comes from suffering, right? So you have to suffer for your work. And, and, and we do that because we, we love what we do. I mean, if you don't value making, you're not going to suffer for it. Right. And that's the thing is like, how do you make someone care about what they are doing? And I, I always show this video when one of my talks is a student of mine who decided he wanted to make a guitar by hand. And the cool thing, he just went through all kinds, he got a job with a local carpenter <laughs> and learned the process of, of wood and, and, and the different local woods and how he can, you know, craft the wood part. And then he looked online and got, YouTube videos on the electronics. And I mean, he went through this process for about a year, did Photoshop artwork, burned it in, you know, and it's like all intrinsic because he really, really wanted to do this thing. And he documented his process all the way through. It was really fascinating. But yeah, he put in the work <laughs> and yeah. did the research. <laughs> There's a, a thing that was shared within the course. I'm, I'm going to put it in the links for next week on uh, how accomplishments are, are accomplished, you know, one brick at a time. And, and uh, you know, the, the people who have these, you know, uh, careers of incredible accomplishments, you think, oh, you know, look at the great artwork that they've done. But it's one step at a time, one day at a time, which, you know, goes back to uh, the saying on your website, you know, I'm going to create something good every day. And... And it can be small. I would, that being mm -hmm. said, I don't. I don't think it has to be a grandiose process. So that's why it's important, I think, to do mm -hmm. something little. And I love routines, so I get in like thematic binges where I have like a theme. Like, okay, every day I'm going to make an animated GIF, or every day for the next ten days I'm going to, you know, write a blog post. So it's kind of. Um, you know, I get on these kicks really, <laughs> and it helps if they're little because then you can accomplish them in a short amount of time, but you feel, you feel like you've done something. So I, I don't think it has to be a big project, you know, that's scary and daunting. It's, uh, it's actually probably better that it isn't. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think of, you know, the work that I've done over the years and, you know, it's just like, I do these really short, you know, one paragraph posts and like, yeah. none of them is a work of art, <laughs> but you know, you develop the skills over the years as, as you do that. Uh, you, you say three things. Um, beauty is in the broken, or beauty mm. in the broken, marvelous in the mundane, wow in the now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so why not beauty in the things that aren't broken, <laughs> marvelous in the uh, extraordinary, etc. Yeah. I think, well, we already do that. So mm -hmm. I was trying to go for things that we we sometimes neglect to do. So a lot of people talk about the kintsugi, which is an aesthetic in, J in Japan where they fill the cracks with gold to accentuate the broken as a metaphor mm -hmm. for this. But for me, you know, finding the beauty in the flawed has always been touching to me. So taking an experience like a, what I call I've deemed it a kiwi moment, you know, the ki not the not the people, the fruit. <laughs> you know how, how how they're brown and kind of like fuzzy and just odd looking, right? But then you yeah. break it open and it's this just gorgeous green, beautiful thing. And and for me, having cancer was my ki kiwi moment because on the surface it was it was awful, it was dire, but it so yeah. much came out of that. 
so much, um, you know, I, I throw caution to the wind now. I don't really care what people think. I'm okay with tinkering and playing because I'm not all concerned with, you know, what people, if they don't like my work or not, I don't care. I just want to make it. <laughs> so, so I think for that, um, that reason, Beauty and the Broken. And then I think the mundane is something we should have wonder in the, Van Gogh also had a quote about this, about seeing beauty in the dirtiest corners of the dirtiest apartments, something to that effect, I'm paraphrasing. But um, really appreciating those things and taking those little things in that we overlook, which is why I love the phone. I love having a camera. <laughs> I love having a camera with me at all times yeah. because you can just see, you know, there's rust on that fence and it looks just really <laughs> aesthetically pleasing and I'm gonna capture that moment. Uh, right now and then maybe write a poem about it later. So I think that's really important and the what yeah That's the wow and the now I guess too. Yeah So and there's also a minimalist sense to what you do um, you know, yeah. Brevity minimalism uh, How does that play a role in creativity for you? For me, it's it's about it's one, it's it's not daunting. If you're if you're gonna create something that's really pared down, like like your shorter posts, if if mm -hmm. I did a podcast, it would probably be two minutes long or something each session. But for me, as aesthetically, when I draw, for example, I'm kind of of the it's the Coco Chanel philosophy of, you know, you look in the mirror before you leave and you take off all your accessories except one. <laughs> and I think I think Picasso did that too. I mean, when Picasso started stripping away everything and paring it down to the essence. Right. So for me, when I draw, it's, uh, when I draw for work, which is graphic, you know, capturing, graphically capturing an idea that maybe somebody has said in a keynote or whatever, um, or capturing my own ideas for a slide deck. I really like metaphor, visual metaphors, and I like to be as simple as possible because I feel like, um, not only do I like that style, but I feel like that's probably more effective simplicity. In fact, I have an exercise that I do with adults on you're just using geometric shapes to articulate an idea. You know, how would you use a triangle to articulate this concept or this vocabulary word? Um, and I really think that paring that down takes away the fear some people have of, of creating, of creating art in particular. Um, and everybody can draw a shape, right? <laughs> but the importance is the idea, the idea that you're putting out there with your work. So I'm going to share some of uh, some of your creativity <laughs> here. Uh, so this is a slide deck, and, and this this is your own font on the. Yeah, uh, it is. Yeah, I love unusual fonts. I, I I'm, I'm a I'm a, a what they call an ink stained wretch with a background in journalism. So ah. fonts matter to me. <laughs> Yeah, I hand drew each of those letters and then cut them out. But I, uh -huh. I call that font 1962. I don't know why. <laughs> it kind of looks a little mid-century to me, but I enjoy doing. I draw on my finger, by the way. All my drawings are on my phone with my finger. Hmm. So I, I made a challenge to myself about a year and a half ago. Like, could I create everything on my phone? And I, and I do. That everything I make is on my phone. That's so, working with constraints. <laughs> yeah, it is, and it, sometimes it's it's annoying, but um, but I found that there's enough tools out there on my phone that I can do that. And my go-to drawing app is called Paper. Um, but yeah, I do I do the fonts, I do the drawings, I do the animations, all on my phone. So let's see, creativity is the piercing is piercing the mundane to find the marvelous. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> that proves, okay. Now, for those of you who are watching this, we already talked about piercing in this video. <laughs> we already talked about uh, finding the marvelous in the mundane. This slide selection was completely random. <laughs> That's funny. That's how things happen. But, you know, that is important because I, if you believe creativity is seeing relationships that, and juxtapositions that mm -hmm. other people don't notice, yeah, and then that is really, that quote really hits home. And, and 
for me, and, and we're going to come back to this in a bit, uh, but for me, a lot of creativity has to do with pattern recognition, right? And it's, it's funny when you say, you know, I, I think there's a rigorous process in that. I'm kind of the opposite in that, you know, I just, it's like I take a bunch of papers, throw them in the air. Uh, I'm actually making hand gestures, although nobody can see that. Uh, and, and then look at what has landed and try to find the patterns in that and, and then pull that out and that's the creativity. I agree with you. I actually do that too. And that's a very Dada kind of approach, um, which is why I love bot assisted creativity. Uh -huh. You know, when you have a randomizer and you're just, shoop. Mm -hmm. in fact, I, I had a friend create a randomizer of, uh, for my students, they're gonna get, they press a button and they get two facts from World War uh, One, and then two poetic devices. So they have to write a poem using those two poetic devices and those facts from World War One at the same time. So it'll be fun. So it's the, the random, I've got the slide up here, creativity is not total freedom. The randomness creates the constraint and then they have to find that pattern in that randomness, that is the constraint basically. Exactly. He's trying to pull it all together because that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> what else have we got? Stuff your eyes with wonder. Oh, Tell me I about love, that. I love that quote. So. I don't know if you're like this. I know you take really great photos. I've been a fan of your photography for a while. Um, but, you know, people hate walking with me because I, I'm constantly, especially if I'm traveling, I'm in a new city, just looking around like a child. I have a child's sense of, of wonder about the world. And, you know, I, I can be intrigued by a brick wall. or you know, <laughs> And so I, I see things sometimes a piece of trash on the ground that looks like a unicorn or something. And I think that's what we're talking about here is that we're so, we're so just blase and we're so blind to the wonders of everything. So really honing in on the details and then using that for something interesting to create something interesting um, is kind of what it's all about. And also archiving those, because if you don't keep those experiences somehow, either with your phone, with your ph photography or with a journal, that's your stuff to create things later, right? So those are the dots that you gotta be collecting, which is why, you know, Da Vinci had a notebook, for example, and he just sketched weird people that he saw on the street or whatever, or put down some ideas for later. Oh yeah, this is, isn't this great? This is uh, somebody on Instagram. Yeah, I love this simplicity of a visual icon for a complex mm. idea. It's not that simple. That would have taken quite a bit of time to do, but- uh... Yeah. But that's, uh, I mean, that's obviously barbed wire or either lines with a bunch of W's. I'm going with barbed wire. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. There's so many great artists out there. So I love having something like a platform like Instagram where I can peruse things and get inspiration, yeah. especially to tweak them for students. You know, how can you emulate this type of thing and make a minimalist poster for a social issue you feel strongly about? Oh, and now I'm now I'm just realizing. Okay, that's Facebook. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It took me. It took it that long for it to click for me. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I'm a little slow on the uptake that's okay. sometimes. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, boy. So, one of the things. So, how does. Uh, I asked it better when we were doing the pre-interview. <laughs> uh, so, okay, I'll just I'll just ask it the way I have it written on my copious notes here. Uh, can we create facts? Can we create knowledge or truth? Oh, this is the most difficult question for <laughs> before eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, well. I'm, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I think, I think we can, but I mean, I'm sure there's a great argument against that, but I think we, we can create our own reality. Although everybody says, you know, art is a lie, but I think, um, in a way 
I'm not sure where you're going with this. I know you talked about the consensus part, and I was, and I told you I hate consensus. So yeah, <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking back at like I've been studying the Dadaist movement lately, and right. it's so interesting to sort of as a backlash to what was other stuff that was going on at that time. They sort of created their own reality. Even their own name was sort of this sure. whimsical kind of creation, and and in. The process of making things, for example, taking out something out of a hat and creating a poem, impromptu poem on it, um, or doing an exquisite corpse together as a community, is it building on each other's creativity and creating something? I think, in a way, that was a new kind of a new truth in in the creation of that. Um, I don't know. I used to teach theory of knowledge, and we, you know, had to hash out what is belief, what is knowledge, justified true belief, blah blah blah. And there was always these. For me, it's about life is about living in the gray, and I hate things that are pushed on you and that are have dichotomies because there's always the gray. Sure. And being, being a history teacher, you know, it always bothered me in history that we were ignoring all the gray areas. You know, you know the the canon of of history teaching is, you know, here's the facts, you know, and you know, this is what you need to know and blah, blah, blah. But that's not how it all exactly went down. You know, that's how it's been transcribed over time. So I love looking at backstories and and the gray areas. And, and I don't like, uh, for example, at conferences when they have a debate and they say this position or this position, it's, why don't we just say, what if? <laughs> <laughs> or to what extent <laughs> is this this? But you can't say is it or is it not. I don't know. That's just my personal feeling of living in the gray. <laughs> Thinking way back to the beginning of this course, um, we began with uh, a module on data. And uh, the idea here was that we're in a period of transition from uh, content broadly conceived as narrative to concept as data. And the act, the whole question of history was actually raised there. There's this push in history and in journalism to try to, if you will, make sense of it or explain it. And I'm putting both of those words in quotes. I just don't want to overuse my hands on the air quote. Uh, by putting it into a narrative, by isolating a single cause, by, by pointing to the key person that was involved. And, mm. and we fool ourselves into thinking we've created an explanation when we do that. But of course, we've created a fiction, haven't we? Yeah, because we're drawn to stories anyway. So we'll make yeah. a story out of everything, right? We we'll make a story out of everything. And, <laughs> and then... then we, we take one of those stories and we say, oh, this one is the truth. <laughs> right. um, but in fact, these are complex, messy events. Yeah, so exploring perspectives, I think, would be a healthier way to deal with anything, is explore yeah. the perspectives. And actually, the, the class I taught was more about that rather than mm -hmm. traditional philosophy. It was exploring all the multiple perspectives and kind of evaluating them. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, and uh, one of the major, and I haven't thought about this for a while, but I have thought of it, yay, uh, is that one of the major motivations for participating and in, in, in creating art and, and teaching art, for that matter, is to develop this capacity to see things from different or multiple perspectives. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as, as I like to say, finding these patterns in the data. Yeah, my something just popped into my head, which my mm -hmm. mother used to tell me, uh, rest in peace, mom. And she used to tell me every car has a story. Mm. And, you know, we lived in California, car culture, everybody had a car. And she she was trying to tell me that to have empathy for other people and and really think and she also said the most lovable need the most love and so when I had when I have students that I figure ah, <laughs> I, I, I remember that I remember that phrase from her and I think the empathy that we can get from from understanding other people's stories their backstories is really important as humans and I think it's the thing for me the future is artisanal like as much as people say oh 
we're going to have computers can create art now. Well, of course computers can create art. A, a computer can create a Van Gogh that looks just like a Van Gogh. But where's the backstory? Where's the pain and struggle? Where's the, where's the part that is poignant and touches my soul? I want to know the backstory. So I think people will be, in the future, will be more attracted to that backstory. Already in branding, they are. People mm -hmm. love that. It, 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 there's a big movement in brands um, for that backstory and that that emotional connection um, and even the flaws, you know? So I, I would much rather buy a flawed, you know, handcrafted wooden mug from Lapland than, <laughs> than you know, like in a perfect mug here. So, I mean, that kind of thing, I think it's, it's gonna be a trend. Yeah. <laughs> My flawed mug. Careful, you have a majorly <laughs> flawed mug. Uh, yeah, that and experience is a trend. I mean, I think we're craving that as well, like experiential things rather than stuff. So I think media reflects that, right? Instead of content, we want the experience. Mm -hmm. We don't but just want stuff to consume. I, I have a note here somewhere. The, uh, the creation of the content is part of the content, basically. Yeah. I, I completely believe that, especially with all of the participatory platforms out there. Um, and even, you know, even stuff that doesn't seem participatory, something like Instagram, which, mm -hmm. you know, you're putting something out there and you maybe get a comment to it, you know, whatever. But that I see, like my daughter uses that, leverages that platform quite a bit for her artwork. And I really see this connection. She's got all these people that they do challenges with each other and, art challenges and have discussions about their art. And it's become really interesting that that's facilitated the process because they'll, you know, this community has grown around a thing, you know, and creates together as well, you know, almost like a days of a salon, you know, we're creating together. The, uh, the e-learning 3.0 MOOC was uh, unique in my history of MOOCs in that I stole from uh, Jim Groom the idea of having these tasks. Uh, the, uh, the idea was that people would contribute tasks and then people would do them just as you've described. That didn't happen because there weren't enough people in the course, but nonetheless, there were weekly tasks and people really got into that and that added a lot, a lot to the course. So I think the, the creativity, the actual creation of stuff that had something to do with what we were talking about, I think was important. Well, the fact that you would give permission as in DS106, like the permission to co-contribute to, mm -hmm. to the, whatever the specs are, you know? <laughs> yeah. so, or they altered it. And, and I've tried, I have tried to do that with my students as well over the years. Um, you know, if they have a great idea. In fact, that was a question on my final exam about six years ago was propose a project <laughs> for yeah. next semester. And, and we did them all, you know, every, we did everyone's project. I love it was that. really interesting. And, and whenever there was a new um, app that came out, you know, cause I can't keep up with everything. But you know, I remember when Vine came out. I said, "Okay, there's this new thing called Vine. It has nothing to do with education, insofar as like that's not why they made it. But what would you propose? How could we make it relevant to our class? What would you propose as a project?" And kids would come up with ideas. So it was really interesting to you know kind of crowdsource the teaching <laughs> right? yeah. and ask my students what they would do. So, so you said in our conversation. Um, that you don't like consensus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll do anything to be different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I don't, it's not healthy. I, I think a diversity of, of opinions and of experiences is really uh, where, it's, where it's at. I mean, any team is made better by having a diverse set of people. In fact, I was watching a, a really interesting documentary on the Mad Men era of mm -hmm. uh, advertising. And when they moved the, co the copywriters to the same floor as the artists, the designers, miracles happened. But before they were separated, so they didn't have this, this sharing of ideas and they were siloed, right? And it's just what we do in education too. It's right, yeah. ridiculous that we silo things. But, but having, so I, I think I read something recently too, is like 
people should always have an artist on staff, <laughs> a resident, <laughs> an artist and resident, because artists just think differently than. I think an artist wrote whatever. that though. <laughs> Probably, um, but it's true, and it's 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 interesting. I I interviewed a, a scientist. He's a exomoonologist named David Kipping. I think I wrote a post about him, but I was fascinated because he was using YouTube as a way to engage with the public on this very specific niche topic, you know, that's highly academic. Uh, I think he's at Columbia or something. And, but he was such a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what is the, the mix between, you know, your storytelling technique, which is, seems like something totally from the humanities, and then your job as this scientist, you know? <laughs> and so it was scientist as storyteller. And I was fascinated by that mixture of, of talents that he had. And, and how we could all learn from that. Yeah, my my experience and my observation has been that uh, it's you know having different areas of interest, dramatically different areas of interest, creates a crossover effect where you know your your art influences your writing or your science, and you're going to have to tell me what an exomunologist is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I only learned it from looking. At it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, a funny story about that. This is this is great for a media uh, talk. But I was watching him on a science show with my daughter on the British on BBC or something, mm -hmm. and he said something really interesting. So I sketched it right then and there. I sketched his quote and him, and I put it out on Twitter. And I found his Twitter handle. And tagged him, and then he wrote me back right when I was watching him. <laughs> and my daughter freaked out. She's like, "I can't believe you just wrote this guy, and he's on our TV." <laughs> and it was just this miracle to her. It was just, and I said, "Well, that's what social media can do. It can bring yeah. you closer to these people that would never, you know, you'd never think to have a conversation." And then, then I interviewed him after that. So, and then you really got to meet him. <laughs> so. There's uh, something else you've written. We're, we're just sort of Bop working our way to a close here. But uh, creativity is a way of being. Yeah. What do you I, mean by that? I truly believe it. It's. I don't think it's a thing so much as a way, a Tao. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it's it's a way of approaching the world. Mm -hmm. It's a way of living your life. It's a way, and again, that sense of wonder, uh, feeling okay with ambiguity which Keats called negative capability. And it's like uh, being unafraid to tinker, being okay with failing and then moving on from that. You know, all these things kind of combine to help, help you leave a, live a creative life. Um, and again, like seeing relationships and things that other people might just miss or dismiss because they're too busy with their daily life, but really honing in on those. And, um, yeah, so I think it's I think people think of it as a, a thing and they often associate it of course with artists, but I don't think it's about being an artist at all. I think it's like living like an artist, but perhaps, but that's that's a really lazy, I guess, um analogy. I think <laughs> I yeah. think it needs something better. I but I'm not sure what. Um but I think there's so many people out there in different professions and different callings that have this living like an artist mentality and that's why they're successful in what they do and that's why they lead humanity in different directions for example certain scientists you know might do that because they are actually living like an artist sure i always think of richard feynman when, yes. when people talk like that and yeah his bongo drums and exactly and, <laughs> but it's also the I, and this is something I found important over the years, the way he throws himself into whatever he's doing. Uh, yeah, it's that old saying, which is such a cliche, but like, you know, dance like nobody's watching. But but the, the sense that when you're in that area or in that space, you're focused on what you're doing and, and you focus your entire mind on what you're doing. You don't have this other voice in the back of your head saying, but what will people think? Yeah, the internal editor. It's like, kill yeah. that thing, kill that thing. And for me, it helped just having gone through like cancer, really, because yeah. I used to be very concerned about pop But to me, I'm like, well, I might not make it till tomorrow. So what am I going to make to leave a yeah. legacy? You know, <laughs> that's my philosophy. But I think the less you care, and this is where consensus comes in, like the less you mm -hmm. care about 
what the world thinks or consensus, then the more um, adventurous you will be. And and don't take yourself so seriously too. <laughs> helps. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> yeah. I think being whimsical actually helps because yeah. through play, through tinkering and play, um, important and serious things can come out of that. So Edison, for example, used this really mm -hmm. cool technique where he'd write down free association, streams of free association words, and then mix and match the words and see what he could force out of those combinations. And that's how he came up with half of his inventions. Sure. So what, what would happen if I mixed this with that? So I Remix, think that sense, yeah, yeah, the sense of play is really yeah. as, a, as a thing that you do and, uh, and make a priority in your life is important. So short of having cancer, how do you get to that point in your life? Because you know, yeah. as, as valuable I, as the experience was for you, I'm not going to yeah. recommend it. No, 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 no. Um, well, I think I think we all need to look at our own mortality. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we just had in this year, we had this terrible ICBM missile thing come on our phone. And I have yeah. never been so utterly frightened in my life because we all did believe it was real and we were going to blow up in 15 minutes and um things like that hit you sometimes and you you brought back into wow you know life is so frail and fragile how am i going to make the most of my my day so don't sweat the small stuff right that's just yeah. such a cliche but really when you you're absorbed with all these little things that are really not important and if you focus on, instead of on negativity and all the little things you focus on creativity and positivity without sounding too hippy dippy about it but i mean really um it frees you up for a lot of things so i always say don't hate create so instead of having a, a stupid argument on twitter <laughs> why don't you go make something <laughs> you know it's like, and contribute positively to the world even if it you know for whatever that is it could be a, a blog post if you're into writing but you know do something productive and spend your time that way is my philosophy. So I, I tend to not think of social media as a, as a negative space like so many people do. I think of it as what can, how can we use it to, to make a positive impact in other people's lives, even if it's just a silly little drawing that mm -hmm. brightens up somebody's day. And I have had people tell me that. Oh, you just made my day with that silly little drawing. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I like, how that works. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true, and I think people people are craving that, and people want fun and whimsy. Yeah. Yeah. To to me, the idea of living and working openly is a big part of that. Um, uh, you know, I mean, not so that you can get nice letters back or, or things no. like that. Um, but but just the the act of sharing, uh, you know, whatever it is, like sharing this interview or 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 you know, sharing ideas, sharing writing, sharing photos, sharing drawings, uh, is putting these things back into the world. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought. There. Yeah, <laughs> but no, you know, I think, you know what I mean, right? Yeah, and people can see that you're. It didn't just pop in. You know, you just, there was a process to it, and and you might have. Yeah. had issues and you might have had to overcome a failure before you got to whatever you're putting out into the world or you know what's behind your thinking mm -hmm. i love i don't know if you've seen nick suzanis's work have you uh, he's he did this actually i have it right here he did the first one of the first um it's a, called unflattening it's a graphic novel phd thesis oh and i've heard of that it's brilliant um howard Rheingold introduced me to him but it's he had the entire process of his PhD thesis and all the sketches and pre sketches he did for this are all online. So he just worked mm -hmm. completely openly throughout his whole experience, um, which I thought was fascinating because it was a peek inside this genius's mind, you know, <laughs> which is yeah, am yeah. amazing. And it's it takes it's funny, it takes a certain either a certain confidence or a certain not caring. <laughs> Yeah, uh, one for or me, the it's, it's the not caring. I am definitely not yeah. confident. So for me, I've just got to just not care. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's probably the secret. I mean, people, yeah. think it's confidence, but it isn't. It's like, you know, what's and and I think I think I saw that somewhere in your writing too. You know, it's it's a case of what's the worst that could happen. Right, uh, right. You know, and, and then and, the 
the jealousy too. I think I wrote that about that in my. Whenever you see someone's work that's better than yours, and of course there always will be. There always will be. Yeah. You, you cannot let yourself get jealous. The only thing you can do is make more work because the more you make, the better you'll be at what you do. And it's just like yeah. you know, and that's all you can do. So. Yeah, and and I I have to actually actively tell myself sometimes that I should be really happy for that person and that their career is working out so well. <laughs> no, it's hard sometimes. I know it's hard, but it's true. I actually am really happy for that person. It's just I have to make that the most important thought that I have. It's yeah. but yeah, it's, it can be hard. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, reading about famous people who we always think, you know, just had it so easy and their work is so exemplary is interesting because you really see that it took a long time for some of them to get past a lot of hurdles. And that yeah. I think is one of the best things we can do is just immerse ourselves in those stories and, and you know, read biographies of those kinds of people yeah. to see their, how they overcame their struggles. One of the most important books I've read is Ray Monk's biography of Ludwig Wittgenstein. And mm. Yeah, it's 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 a great biography because you know it, it does explain Wittgenstein's philosophical positions, um, and and I thought that that part of it was good, but seeing the life behind them, and and uh, and how you know the things. It was called, uh, the subtitle was like The Duty of Genius, I think it was. Uh, and Wittgenstein lived his entire life as though he was bound by these mortal obligations. Uh, and wow. he had to, yeah, I know, it was. it's very depressing. <laughs> um, you know, and, and was hit with, with self-doubt and depression. He's only the most important philosopher of the 20th century. And he spent his entire life in self-doubt and depression and so it's very illustrative to me yeah uh there's i think there's a, a healthy kind of thing about melancholy yeah. <laughs> actually that i think there's there's a kind of melancholy van gogh talked about this that actually propels you to do better work um and even though it's not fun to be melancholic <laughs> yeah. it can it can actually contribute to greater cr creativity so but then and finally I read, was it from Russell? Yeah, just the other day. It was in a blog or something. Uh, the the secret is, as you know, the secret to growing older. And I shouldn't say the secret because none of this stuff is a secret. Uh, <laughs> uh, is to more and more make things less and less about yourself, and more and more about your community, your society, humanity, etc. So that you know you're you're not letting go of things you know, it's, you're becoming part of greater and greater holes. I didn't express that nearly as well as it was expressed <laughs> in the article, but, uh, and that seems relevant to me as well. Uh, you know, there was a discussion earlier in, from the previous uh, conversation of the role of empathy, because, um, I mean, you know, when you look at people's lives, uh, you know, and I, I, I do that a lot. It's not looking at the cars that go by. It's like uh, looking at web pages. And I used mm -hmm. to spend days, when the internet first started, just days going from one website to another to another. And, of course, in every website, there's a whole person there. You know, And, and I do that when I walk around cities now and I, I look at people. And there's a whole person, right, the whole history, uh, thoughts, hopes, dreams, ambitions, and all of that. And, I have to remind myself that that's a whole person there. Everything that you are is in there. Um, and, oh, dang, I keep losing my train of thought. <laughs> but. Uh, oh. The empathy? You were talking about empathy? Yeah, oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Speaking of getting old and <laughs> doddering. <laughs> uh, Empathy is a great and necessary thing, and it's the source of most of the beauty that we find in the world. Probably, uh, you know this. This you know every time we look at things, we see the patterns, we see the insights, and all of that. Um, but it can't be something that we depend on. 
and this was the other side of the discussion. Um, we were talking about consensus, but not consensus in the sense that everybody is the same, yeah. but consensus in the sense that in order to interact at all, we need to have a common point of interaction. Mm. Okay. Uh, you know, a, a minimal fact set, if you will. And, and, and so we need to generate, create these facts. Like norms, like social norms kind of thing? And like social norms, like common meanings of words, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the story around that word, uh, you know. Um, uh, so back to poignant again, <laughs> right? Um, and that's where our consensus comes. Um, but to create that consensus, we can't depend on empathy. Mm. Um, it'd be nice if we could. Um, you know, I, you know, they, you know and, I, and I think that's what the idealist dream of the society is, is that, and, and I am an idealist, but, uh, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, we, we connect in this empathetic way and that's what creates these norms. But in the other real world, uh, which we unfortunately live in, uh, the connection has to be, well, minimal. Um, you know, it's got to be you know, the minimal viable connection. In, in a sense, I just made that up, and it's a terrible <laughs> phrase, and I regret doing it. Um, what do you think? Let, let me stop talking and see what you think mm. about that. So, okay, let me, <laughs> I'm yeah. scooching around here. <laughs> I'm yeah. adjusting myself. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like an affinity group kind of a thing where you'd have sort of, you gravitate around an affinity and then that becomes your minimal viable connection or? Well, a lot of the concepts in our course that we talked about have come out of uh, the original peer-to-peer -peer web Right, and so, uh, you know, just can you make a connection at all? Mm -hmm. uh, but then, um, you know, also some of the concepts that have come out of the blockchain world where you're sharing information, uh, but how do you know that that information is true? Or, you know, a, an accurate representation of what was said, for example, because in the blockchain world, that's the world of commerce and finance. Right. And in the world of commerce and finance, there is no empathy. Uh, yeah. There's there's nothing except we must make money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's talking about minimal viable anything. Uh, you know, and and of course, you know, it's not really a world I like. But there are you know, in our world community, there are people like that. And I'm thinking if we say we depend or count on empathy uh then these people will take advantage of that and wreck the system right uh, look what happened to twitter <laughs> look what happened to facebook so there's a sense in which we need a non-empathy based way of sharing and communicating so that we can create truth through say our creations but more to the point people at the other end can know that, yeah, that was truth that was created and not like, you know, advertising. Well, I'm a big proponent of being in charge of your own story, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and kind of, and I agree with you. Like there's a, I mean, there's a major empathy deficit really. And we're, I think as humans, I'm a little more Hobbesian when it comes to <laughs> what humans <laughs> are. I, I really do think, uh, everyone's kind of out for themselves in a certain amount you know i don't know i i have lost hope sometimes uh for humanity but i think but i do i do try to live and i try to be uh as empathetic as i can and, and have hope for the the good of people <laughs> but mm -hmm. i think you're right you have to be empowered to take charge of your own story and be empowered to Put that out in the world the way you want it to be um the problem is like i think some of us don't even know our own stories yeah. <laughs> some of us aren't you know what i mean like what, what we're so multifaceted i don't know how like what is my truth i don't even know like i'm so many things to different people right and even myself sure. um but i think 
I see your point of of not letting anyone sort of boss the empaths around, <laughs> sort of thing, right? Um, and yeah, and it, 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 I don't know. I do agree. Like everything comes down to money sometimes, and that's just the way the world works, unfortunately. But the the only thing we can do is to to put things out in the world that we make, for example, mm -hmm. that are for me, like intrinsically just make the world a better place for whatever reason. They could just be a fun thing or a joyous thing. I think finding joy is really important. I think I think the internet is joyless <laughs> to some to some extent. <laughs> or it's getting that yeah. way. I think there yeah. Crazy. Yeah, but I think it's getting there's I think everything, media is just joyless. And where is the joy? So I tend to create little bubbles of media, filter bubbles where I'm just looking at artists and videographers and photographers and, and things that make my life fulfilled rather than all the arguments and whatever and negativity on social media. So I think I've created my own filter bubbles and I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of where I am at with yeah. it. But um, yeah, I, this is, that's a conundrum because I, I do think empathy is at a deficit which is why it's such an important thing for people in uh, who are in K twelve education to emphasize that, and uh, and a lot of people are doing design thinking where you get inside, you know, the user, you know, right. whatever the whoever your the audience is, what do they need, what are their, you know, desires, what you know, how can we create this thing for them um, by knowing them, and to know them, you got to ask them. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like getting to rely on them telling you what they what they want or like. Sometimes they don't know, but you ask them interesting questions. So, um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of teachers and and other people that are designing learning experiences are getting into design thinking as sort of the way to to design something specifically for a particular user based on their needs, their individual particular needs. That's interesting. It's it's not the first time design thinking has come up in this course, although it's come up in independent ways each time it's come up. So I'll have to think about that. I think that's probably a good place to to wrap up. We've gone over an hour, and I really, really appreciate you waking up early on a Sunday morning. Uh, although it's Hawaii, so the sunrise will be beautiful. Yeah, I guess it's it's coming up. It's slowly popping up over the mountains. Um, I wanted to leave by sharing a word that I learned, another word, this is becoming, but it's uh, something I use in presentations about, it's a Greek word, and it's called Meraki, M-E-R-A-K-I, and it's the, the heart and soul and love that you put into your creative work, whatever that might be, if it's making a cake, doing a piece of art, writing a blog, whatever, a blog post, um, but I love this because I think when you make things, this thing happens, right? This Meraki happens and it's this joy that you get from it and this pleasure and this satisfaction that you get from creating something and putting it out in the world and sharing it. Um, so that's Meraki, but I love that term. That's a great term. We'll end on that note. Uh, so <laughs> okay. Thank you for everyone. We're oh, geez, we just got a bunch of viewers join us. Oh uh, my goodness! <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy Burval. Uh, this was the week eight conversation. We have one more conversation, which will be this Tuesday at noon. So just a couple of days from now. Um, and, uh, and then that'll be it for the course. So I'll uh, see you all on Tuesday or in the newsletter. Thank you, Amy. I'm Stephen Downs. Aloha. <laughs>